Long QT syndrome is a hereditary disorder of the electricity of the heart and the abnormality occurs at a molecular level. All the cells in the heart communicate with each other through small holes and these small holes are known as ion channels. When an electrical impulse passes through the heart, certain things happen. We have sodium ions which sit outside the heart. We've got potassium ion channels which sit inside the heart. When an electrical impulse passes, sodium ion channels whoosh into the heart, potassium ion channels leave the heart. As the impulse goes away, the reverse process happens. The sodium ion channels leave the heart muscle cell. The potassium ion channels come back into the heart muscle cells. Now, the long QT syndromes are syndromes where either the sodium ion channels or the potassium ion channels are defective. These are hereditary conditions in which the heart looks completely normal. So if we did a heart scan, looking at the ultrasound, the heart would look normal. But the ECG looks very abnormal. On the ECG, we measure something called the QT interval. This is the, in this is the time that it takes for the heart to come back to normal from an electrical impulse. In URI, we've got normal me measures of the QT interval. The QT interval ranges between 440 to 460 milliseconds. It's shorter in males, around 440, a bit longer in females, around 460. But anything above 440 in a male or 460 in a female is regarded as abnormal. Now, the diagnosis of long QT syndrome is very, very important. Because the heart muscle is not affected, these people don't feel tired, they're not breathless, they're very, very well. In fact, many people go into their grave in their eighth or ninth decade without any symptoms. But a significant proportion experience important symptoms. Blackouts, palpitations, and dizziness are cardinal features of the long QT syndrome. These blackouts may occur during sport, during intense emotions such as intense fear, nervousness about doing a concert, nervousness about upcoming exams. We've had cases of people at university that have died just before exams. Deaths may occur during a concert. Loud music can set off a surge of adrenaline in the bloodstream that can cause sudden death. Sudden alarm bells from a mobile phone in the middle of the night can wake an individual, startle the individual and cause sudden death. Again, we've had cases of people who've died as their mobile phone alarm bell went off in the early hours of the morning. These are important features. There are a small number of people with long QT syndrome that may actually die during sleep. One of the other important features I've not talked about is that not everything that affects the heart presents with blackout, palpitation or chest pain. The heart's an important organ that provides blood to other important organs. The one organ that just cannot survive without oxygen or glucose is the brain. So if you can imagine if the heart goes into a very fatal rhythm, very quickly the blood supply to the brain will shut off. The athlete or the young person may present at that point with a blackout or with the brain not working well, go into an epileptic fit. You may have heard about people like John Travolta's son who was on holiday with him recently and died of an epileptic fit. Whilst it's clear that epileptic fits can kill people, for people like me, the question mark was, was that the long QT syndrome that was misdiagnosed as epilepsy? Was that an opportunity to screen other young children in the family? It's very, very important that epilepsy may be a brain problem, but always exclude a heart problem, particularly long QT in this situation. So we've diagnosed the condition. How do we characterize risk? Because not everybody with long QT is going to die suddenly. But those people that are blacking out without warning, and those people with a, with a QT interval that's more than 500 milliseconds, or those people in whom we've documented nasty rhythm disturbances, even though they've not actually fainted or come near fainting, they're the sort of people that are treated with beta blockers. Beta blockers are very, very good drugs and are very effective in long QT syndrome, particularly long QT syndrome 1 and long QT syndrome 2. I'm not going to go into detail into the various types of long QT syndromes, but 1, 2 and 3 are the common ones. Long QT1 and long QT2 respond very nicely to beta blockers. Long QT3 doesn't respond very nicely to beta blockers. So if someone's got long QT3, if we can pick that up genetically, we offer that sort of person defibrillators. So everybody gets beta blockers. The sort of people get defibrillators are people 
who have got who who have survived a sudden death. People have got acute interval of more than 500 milliseconds. People have got nasty ventricular rhythm disturbances, even though they've not quite caused a faint or a sudden death. And those with long QT syndrome type three. This goes without saying that once a diagnosis has been made, it's very important that other first degree relatives are looked after and diagnosed. This is very important in females, particularly childbearing years. They're absolutely very well during pregnancy, but the death rate after delivering during lactation is very high, so it's very important to get the diagnosis right.